know, each one of us is a multi-dimensional person. We have different relationships and we fill several different roles. Uh, if you looked at my Facebook page, you will see uh, uh, hundreds of pictures on there. Uh, there is a picture of, of me behind this pulpit. And that shows that I am your pastor. There's a picture of me and Debbie on our wedding day 46 years ago. That shows you that I'm a husband. We have a family picture that was taken a couple of Christmases ago. With all, when all 20 of us were together, that shows you that I, I'm a father of four and a grandfather of ten. And then there's the pictures of, of me with my deer and my fish. That tells you that I'm a fisherman and, deer, and a deer hunter. Well, likewise, the Bible presents the Christian uh, in, in several different pictures and, and uh, uh, several different uh, analogies and in several different snapshots. We're going to read in 2 Timothy chapter 2 today, and, uh, and I want to point out to you seven pictures of a Christian. Now, I know seven is a lot, but we'll try to be uh, brief and sketchy with these and just try to give you something to think about and remind you of what, uh, what your role and what your position is and what your relationship is with other people. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. And let's start at the beginning. That's always a good place to start, right? Verse 1, he says, Thou therefore, this is Paul writing to Timothy, his protege, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, no man that warreth entangleth himself in the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned except he strive lawfully. The husbandman, or that is the farmer, that laboreth must first be a partaker of his fruits. And then let's, let's skip down, if you can, guys, to verse uh, uh, 15. Uh, verse 15. In verse 15, he says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more, godly, uh, to more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker or a cancer, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet or fit for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness and faith and charity and peace and them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they uh, do gender strifes and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God, peradventure, will give them repentance to, uh, to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive uh, by him at his will." Different pictures of what the believer should be. The first picture that he gives us is that of a teacher. There in verse 2, he says, The things that I have taught you, you need to teach other men who will also teach other men. Paul had taught Timothy, and Timothy was to find other men that he could teach, and they were to find other men who they could teach. Uh, uh, the writer William Barclay explains this situation, this concept. He says that the teacher is a link in the living chain which stretches unbroken from this present moment back to Jesus Christ. The glory of teaching is that it links the present with the earthly life of Jesus Christ. The apostles, including Paul, had received from Christ the, his message and they taught 
uh, their followers in those ways. And like Paul had taught Timothy, and Timothy now as a pastor was to teach other people. Uh, and they were supposed to pass the baton on from one person uh, to the next. This refers not just to those who are, are official teachers and elected teachers in, uh, in the uh, church, but all of us are supposed to be teachers of other people. In the home, fathers and mothers are to teach their children. In uh, church, the older women are supposed to teach the younger women. The older men are supposed to teach the younger men. And we fulfill that responsibility and that picture by preaching and teaching and witnessing and sharing what we know to other people and encouraging them to share it with others. As an example, there's this story that I found. In 1858, there was a Sunday school teacher in Boston named Mr. Kimball. And he uh, led a shoe clerk to give his life to Christ. That shoe clerk's name was Dwight Moody. Dwight Moody was called to the Lord to be an evangelist. He went to England in 1879, and he, uh, there he awakened uh, the heart of a pastor named Frederick Meyer. Frederick Meyer uh, came to America and preached at a college campus where he found a student that he led to Christ. That student's name was Wilbur J. Chapman. Wilbur Chapman became a preacher. He worked extensively with the YMCA, the Young Men's Christians Association. And there he uh, found a, a man named Billy Sunday, who had been a, a wild and, and uh, sinful baseball player who got saved on a, on a, by a, uh, at a street meeting one day, gave his life to Christ, became a preacher, and gave up baseball. Billy Sunday went to work with, uh, with William, Wilbur Chapman and the YMCA. Uh, Billy, Chapman, uh, Billy Sunday went to Charlotte, North Carolina, and held an evangelistic meeting. It was so successful that sometime later, a group of businessmen in Charlotte, North Carolina, decided to hold another revival meeting, citywide meeting, and they invited a preacher named Mordecai Ham to come and preach. During that meeting, there was a young man named Billy Graham who attended that meeting and gave his heart to Christ, and you know the rest of that story. Uh, only heaven will reveal how many people have come to Christ as a result of the ministry of Billy Graham. And all of that started, that chain started uh, uh, over uh, almost now, what, about 180 years ago by a Sunday school teacher named Mr. Kimball. Uh, we sometimes underestimate the influence that a Sunday school teacher, that a father or a mother can have over people. We never know the people that we lead to Christ or the people that we encourage in their Christian walk. We never know how, how a much greater their impact will be than ours is. So the Christian is supposed to be a teacher, and I hope that you embrace that role that you have. He also gives us a picture that a Christian is a soldier. He talks about that in verses 3 and 4. Paul often used military terms to describe uh, Christian, uh, the Christian life, the Christian walk, the Christian ministry. He used a lot of military illustrations in his letter. And he uh, lived in a military state. And because of the strength of that military, that's why he found himself in prison. As Christians, we are engaged. We're supposed to be engaged in a spiritual warfare we're reminded in the book of Ephesians that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers against spiritual wickedness in high places. Uh, some of you uh, have like very much experience being soldiers, and you could speak better to this than I can. But just from my observation from this scripture and my observation of people, there's some things about soldiers that fit the picture here. Uh, as, a, as Christians and as soldiers, we must endure hardship. Basic training, I'm told, is quite strenuous, right? Maybe not as hard as it used to be. Uh, the battlefield conditions are dangerous, uncomfortable, even life-threatening. Soldiers have to spend months, sometimes years, away from their homes, away from their families, away from the comforts that they enjoy as private citizens here at home. The Christian life 
It's not a playground, but it is a battleground. The Christian life is not easy. We must make sacrifices. We must endure hardship sometime. And if you, if you always seek the easy road and the easy way, you're not going to be a very good Christian I, because Christians are called on to make, uh, to make sacrifices and to make hard decisions sometimes. The soldier must be focused when you are called to be a full-time soldier. Uh, you have to avoid distractions. You have to be fully committed to your task. Everything else in your life has to take a back seat as you become that soldier. You know, as Christians, we can have families, we can have jobs, we can have hobbies, but our priority has to be our relationship with God and the things that He calls us to do. Uh, we have to be focused and keep our attention, rem remember what our primary purpose is. A distracted soldier is not going to be a very effective soldier. We, as soldiers and as Christians, we must be loyal to our commander. Uh, one of the first things I believe that a soldier is taught that you have to obey orders without question, immediately, without explanation, without delay. The safety of, of yourself and of your unit, of your fellow soldiers, depends on that loyalty and on that immediate response to orders that are given. And Christians have to have that same quality. You know, someone has said that delayed obedi obedience is disobedience. When an order is given uh, by a commanding officer, when an order is given by the Lord, we need to have immediate response. Uh, the, as soldiers, likewise, as Christians, we must go wherever we're sent, and we must do whatever we're called to do. So here's a picture of a soldier. A soldier must be committed. Tom Brokaw, you recognize the name from uh, his years that he spent as a journalist, a newscaster on television. He wrote a book called The Greatest Generation. And in that book, he told uh, stories of men and women who served our country during World War II. These, uh, these people came from all walks of life. They were actors and athletes and workers and students, farmers and city dwellers. And they sacrificed their individual lives for the cause of freedom, the call, for the cause of America and the world. And in his book, Brokaw makes the point that he believes that this was the greatest generation because of their sacrifice and their dedication and their commitment. The soldier's supreme virtue is that he is faithful to death, that he will not surrender, that he will not give up, that he will not back down, that he will not quit, that he is willing to give his life for his fellow soldiers and for his country. And, uh, and that sh likewise should be the commitment of the Christian that we, like Paul, will be faithful to death. So we have the picture of a soldier. The next picture that's given to us here is that of an athlete in verse 5. He talks about striving for masteries and being crowned. There are, in Paul's writings, there are more than two dozen references to athletics Perhaps Paul had been an athlete himself. He talked about running and wrestling and fighting and boxing, different things. Uh, the Greeks and Romans were very enthusiastic athletes, and they built uh, the, you know, the Colosseums, the amphitheaters uh, are examples of what crowds came to uh, watch the, the uh, athletic competitions. Uh, most likely Paul had reference here to the Olympic Games, that uh, started uh, back in, in Paul's time or, and uh, maybe before Paul's time a little bit and have continued uh, for over 2,000 years in some form and fashion. Athletes must strive. That word strive itself, it comes from the same word where we get our word athletics. It means to do your best, to put forth your best effort. To strive means that you're not content just with participating, but that you want to do your best, that you want to win. When our family gets together for Christmas or other holidays, we play card games and board games, and sometimes it gets pretty competitive. 
My wife com uh, complains sometimes. She thinks I'm too competitive. And when she says that, I quote to her coach Herman Edwards, that famous clip on Sports Center where he said, You play to win the game. So you play with me, I'm going to play to win the game. If you're not, you know. Some people take that too far. Some people say win at any cost. Others say, and my wife had not heard this expression when I shared it with her, but some people, you sports fans will recognize it. They say, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. Well, uh, we are tried to try to do our best, but we must, be, uh, uh, we must be disciplined and we must play by the rules. It was uh, old sports writer Grantland Rice who uh, made that quote, it's not whether you win or lose, but it's how you play the game. And that certainly applies to the Christian life. We must, Paul says that we must strive law, lawfully. We must play by God's rules. We must do things in the right way. Paul says that Olympic athletes uh, do this to win a corruptible crown. They, they did it to win wreaths. Uh, uh, holly wreaths or uh, laurel wreaths around that would be placed around their neck. Today, our Olympic athletes, those who win, get medals, gold medals, silver medals, and bronze medals. These things, uh, the, especially in Paul's day, the, the wreaths that they won were not worth anything. But it, it's what it symbolized. They symboli it symbolized those who worked hard, those who competed fairly, and those who won the contests, he says, they, these people did it to win a corruptible, a temporary, inexpensive award. But he said, we as Christians compete, try to do our best to win a, a crown that is incorruptible, that fades not away. We must be disciplined. The true athlete pushes himself. Right now, uh, last week, the football players started back to practice. Uh, thankfully, they got a break on the weather the first week. Not going to be so much this week, I'm afraid. But they get out there and in the heat and, uh, and push their bodies and exercise and go to the weight room and lift weights. And they, they um, um, just, just really beat themselves up. The, the true athlete, he doesn't let inconvenience stop him. He doesn't let bad weather stop him. He doesn't let sore muscles stop him. He doesn't let other activities that he wants to do interfere with his training. He is focused and disciplined. Think about these Olympic athletes. They train four years to get to compete for just a few days and uh, uh, in hopes that they'll have a medal hung around their neck. And so as Christians, there are lessons that we can learn from athletes who, are, who strive and are disciplined and who play by the rules. Then he gives us a snapshot of a farmer. Some of you know about farming, right? A lot of us older folks grew up on the farm. And one of the things that he talks about, he, 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 he says the husbandman, the husbandman is another word for a farmer or someone who keeps a vineyard and, and grows, uh, grows grapes. Uh, the farm work is hard work. If you're going to work on, grow up on a farm, you've got to work hard. I can re, uh, remember just as a little boy going to the cotton fields with my mom and dad and, and when I was even too little to pick cotton, either uh, they would drag me, or sit me down on the end of the cotton sack and drag me up and down the rows so they could keep an eye on me, or I'd go sit in the shade and play with the cotton bowls. Those were the toys that we had, or sticks, or rocks, or whatever we could find. But uh, in about the time I got old enough to really get into picking cotton, Dad decided he would go to work in the factory, and I wasn't too disappointed that he did that. I do remember... Uh, hoeing cotton some, and I know I hated that. You'd have had these long old rows, and you'd chop the weeds out, and you'd just keep your eyes on the end of that row, and couldn't wait till you got to the end of it, and then they'd say, turn around and go back the other way. And y'all remember that? Oh, those were, seemed like they were such huge fields and such long rows, and it was such hot work and such hard work. Uh, he, 
uses the word use the word laboreth, and the word labor means to toil intensely, to sweat and strain to the point of exhaustion. Crops don't grow by accident. If you leave a field to itself, you're going to have a crop of weeds, and that's about all. Fields have to be plowed and planted and, and weeded and cultivated and watered, and all that work goes in. You know, God's work is hard work sometimes. The seed, that is, the Word has to be planted and watered and cultivated. Sometimes we face a lot of opposition. Uh, sometimes we don't see a lot of results from what we do. So uh, our work is hard work. The farmer has to have patience. You don't plant a, a, a crop one day and harvest it the next day. It takes weeks and months for that seed to germinate and that plant to come up and then, then for the crop to produce on it. There's an old Chinese story about a fellow who planted his rice paddy and he was so eager for that crop to come through, he couldn't wait till those uh, shoots of rice began to grow. And it wasn't growing fast enough to suit him, so he began every day to go out and grab the tops of the rice plants and pull them up to make them taller. And at first, it looked really good. He could see, well, that those uh, rice plants are taller today than they were yesterday. But one hot day, he noticed that all of his rice plants began to turn brown because what had happened in his impatience for the, those rice plants to grow, he'd pulled them out by the roots and the sun scorched them. We can't, uh, we can't hurry the harvest. And James 5, 7 says, See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the fall and spring rains. Patience is a virtue that we need in every area of our life, especially in Christian ministry. We certainly need patience because we, don't, we often work for days and weeks and months without seeing results from it. But we have to trust God at His Word. Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we will reap if we faint not, if we don't give up, if we have patience. The farmer will be rewarded. Uh, here in uh, verse 6, he says, The hard-working farmer should be the first to receive a share of his crop. In 1 Timothy 5.18, he says that the laborer is worthy of his reward. 1 Corinthians 15, he says, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, that we are promised a harvest will come if we are faithful and patient and work hard as the farmer does. In verse 15, he gives us a picture of a student. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Any of y'all recognize that verse? That's our Awana theme verse, isn't it? It's where the, uh, the, the, the acronym Awana comes from, a workman uh, that is not ashamed, come, that, that comes from this verse. To study, it means to be diligent, to be zealous, to work hard. To rightly divide means to cut straight. And so, you know, there are so many false religions in the world. There's so many uh, false teachings, so many false doctrines in the world that how are we going to cut, cut it straight if we don't study? An approved, you know, we're, we're called to be teachers before, before we can teach others, we must study ourselves. And that's something that we can't stress enough. If you're going to teach somebody else, you know, you can't teach somebody something that you don't know. And you, it's hard to teach with conviction if you don't if you're not sure about what you're teaching. So there is a, a diligence here required. Study. We uh, approved worker, someone who is approved, accepted in the eyes of God, is that he doesn't just study so he knows stuff, but he studies and he puts into practice 
what he studies and what he learns. James 1.22 says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only. In verse 17, Paul warned that false teaching, false doctrine, it's like a canker, it's like a cancer, it's like an ulcer that eats away. And so he says that here's one of the snapshots, one of the pictures of a believer to be a student. In verse 6, he compares us to a container or a vessel. He says that in a great house, there are some vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. And he said, if a man will purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use. The word vessel means a container. It's actually describing a, a household container that's used to transport or, or to store uh, things like a canister set where you store sugar and salt and, and different kinds of uh, foods and, and uh, uh, spices and like that. Some containers were made out of ordinary clay and they were very plain looking, rough on the outside. There were other containers that were made out of fine porcelain, painted and shiny. There were other vessels that were made out of precious metal like gold and silver. Um, and all these containers can be useful as long as they're clean. No matter how pretty a container looks like on the outside, if it's dirty, got mold inside of it, or it's got bugs inside of it, you wouldn't want to put your rice or your beans or your salt or your sugar in it, would you? You know, some of us are better looking than others. Some of us are smarter than others. Some of us are more polished than others. Some of us are more gifted and talented than others. And some of that we can't do a whole lot about. But the thing that we do can do something about is we can make sure that we are clean on the inside. And he says that, that we need to purge ourselves so that we can be clean. And God can use us if we are clean, regardless of what we're made of, regardless of what we look at, look like on the outside. James said, draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So believers are containers. We're vessels. And then he gives us the picture of a slave. In verse 24, he says, The servant of the Lord must not strive, but must be gentle. The word servant here, uh, really it means slave. A slave was a personal property of its owner. And we live in a day where people want to exert their individual rights and their personal rights in so many ways. But the scripture says that if you're a Christian, you are not your own. That you have been bought with a price. And that you belong to God, that the Holy Spirit lives in you. We, the scripture tells us that at one time we were all slaves to sin. But Jesus came and bought us off the slave market. He redeemed us. And not only did he redeem us, but then he set us free. There's a passage in Exodus chapter 21 that talks about slavery. And there he gives this description and this uh, command. He says, if you buy a slave and he serves you for six years, but on the seventh year, uh, he, he's allowed to go free. It's, uh, he, uh, then uh, he shall go free without a payment. But if that slave plainly says, I love my master, he treats me right, I uh, will not go out as a free man. He says, I, it's time my, my uh, master has no more hold on me. By law, he has to set me free. But he has been good to me. He's treated me right. He's a good master. I want to stay and continue to live under his roof and to work for him then he says, you'll bring him to the door of the doorpost and his master shall take an awl or like an ice pick and shall uh, pierce his ear with an awl. And that, by that symbol, this slave, this person who was a slave who's been set free is expressing his loyalty, his life, lifelong loyalty to this master and says, I'm a volunteer slave of this man. 
And that is a testimony from now on. That's perhaps where the, uh, the custom of ear piercing began. That's the first reference I can find to it anyway. Paul called himself a slave of Jesus Christ. A slave has no rights of his own. He has no will of his own. He uh, has to do what he is told. Romans 6.22 says, Now, having been made free from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification, and the outcome is eternal life. So here are these seven pictures of what a Christian is and what a Christian should be. Let me ask you today, as a teacher, are you teaching anybody? One of the things that I've been a little concerned about, well, more than a little concerned about is, you know, uh, with the things going on, we've not been able to have Sunday school. And I wonder, are kids missing time where they could be learning? Thankfully, Brenda Carnahan teaches a, a lesson for our kids on Wednesday nights on on our Facebook page, and I hope you're watching that. I hope that you parents are taking up the slack and that you are taking opportunity to teach things to your kids. You know, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a sit-down time. In Deuteronomy, it talks about how that fathers are supposed to teach your sons when we walk by the way and when we sit down and when, we, uh, when we're just uh, going about our daily routine of things, when you're sitting in the hunting blind or when you're sitting in the boat fishing. Uh, that's a good way, good opportunity to teach life lessons and to teach scriptures to, peop uh, to your kids. As a teacher, are you teaching anybody? Find somebody and pour yourself into them. That's the way this relay race of teaching, passing what we know down to someone else that has carried out. As a soldier, are you fighting? Are you involved in the spiritual warfare? Are you resisting the devil, are you just throwing up the white flag and doing whatever he tells you to do? As an athlete, are you striving? Are you trying to do your best? Or are you content just with say, well, I'm participating? As a farmer, are you sowing, planting God's seed and seeing it through to a harvest? As a student, are you studying God's word? Are you learning? As a vessel, are you clean? First John 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As a slave, are you serving? These are some of the things, some of the ways the Bible describes believers. These are some of the things that we are supposed to be doing. Would you stand? We're going to have our song of commitment and if there's a commitment that you, uh, God has put on your heart to do, now's the opportunity for you to do that this morning.